so Robert. Yay. Thank you so much for joining me. Um, yeah. I got hacked, so I don't have a good camera. But uh oh. <laughs> so um, <laughs> that's my my excuse, anyways. Um, <laughs> but like I said, you know, content is more important than um, the vanity of of looking good. Um, but you look good, and that's all that really matters. Um, so thank you so much for being here with me, and. Um, you were you were like an AI fanatic, I would say. Even I would characterize it. Can well, to get like a little bit of an introduction of, of your background and and for those who don't know you and what your experience with AI is. I had a famous Silicon Valley innovation show for a long or blog for a long time, and so I saw all sorts of computer vision and things like Siri. Siri was launched in my house on my show, and that was the first AI app. So I've been following AI as a software technique from the very beginning. And I've just kept being interested in it because it brought something dramatically new over old software techniques like, you know, Visual Basic, which I worked at a magazine for programmers before. Right? Do you program? Do you code yourself? No. I can read it, <laughs> but I never, my mind doesn't take to languages. My mom sent me to German school for three years. I didn't pick up much German either. <laughs> really? Okay. Well, my, my dad and, and our family, we, we had to learn how to code, you know, before it was a catchphrase, learn how to code. Right? Yeah. I, I I mean, I can't really code very much now, but in the beginning of the hey, hey days of the internet, I, I did create websites and things like that. And, well, not... Um, now you can ask, uh, you know, Copilot or something like that, or ChatGPT to write your code for you. <laughs> exactly. So those were completely useless skills. That's what you're really telling me. Not really, because the problem with AI is it puts a lot of errors in your code. And if you don't understand how the code works, you're going to not have a system that works, right? So it's a great point, because that's what the case with journalism as well, which is something yes. that I look at a lot in particular as it relates to AI, because AI um, is being used in journalism and it produces sometimes some terrible mistakes that would mm -hmm. never even be produced by the most lowly human. So it's like, okay, that's interesting. Um, yeah. Which makes me think that maybe we will not be fully replaced by um, AI robots, but uh, some not in the next few months. <laughs> <laughs> okay, thanks. Maybe thank you five years from now, we're all in trouble. <laughs> That's right. I appreciate your optimism. Optimism, but every time, like, I look at your timeline or, or I, I tune into you, you're like testing the latest, the newest thing. You have this sort of the insight. Um, what are the things you're like, hey, you've been most excited about in the last while? Um, well, I mean, chat GPT just changed the world for everybody. Right. Yeah. Um, and there's a whole bunch of new models now that people are playing with and building, which the average consumer hasn't even heard about, right. They don't know what, a. Well, tell us so that we, the average consumers, can be more savvy and pretend mm -hmm. to know what we know. I think the average consumer should just focus on learning Chat GPT for the moment. Um, that's a pretty dramatic change for people, and most people don't know how to use it. You know, they think it's like Google, you spit a little bit at it. Well, you know, here's an example. With Google, you can't do multi-stage prompts. You can't ask it, hey, show me all points of view on a topic, and then in the next prompt, can you show me personas for each point of view? That's something Google doesn't do, right? Yeah. And then the third prompt, uh, can you join those personas together in a South by Southwest panel or a debate club or something like that? You can't do that with Google. And then the fourth thing is you talk to your little debate club about a topic, right? <laughs> about the topic you set it up. So people who... Uh, who are just used to Google or, uh, you know, searching, they don't understand that you can use um, chat GPT to do a whole bunch of new things. For instance, you can ask it how to make a recipe, uh, you know, how to make a uh, Osh soup, you know, a, an Iranian dish. It'll tell you. But now, oh, there's 12 people coming over for, for dinner. So can you rejigger the recipe for 12 people? It can. Ch Google can't do that. 
right? Yeah. It's the refactoring that is powerful. And most people just haven't played with it enough to really understand what it does that way. So, I, you know, learn how to use chat GPT, pay your 20 bucks a month, see, because that gives you much better answers than the version that's free. Um, and then start yeah, playing. Is that with a big difference? Like, yeah. Uh, yeah. yeah. Okay. It, it, it does, particularly if you're trying to do something serious, right. You know, college essay or something. <laughs> the one thing that is, yeah. The call. Yeah. That's a, that's a cheaper way to go about it. But one thing that I've been um, myself quite worried about is so Google for its, all of its perfections. And by the way, there are quite a few, one of which is like, I've noticed it's disappearing a lot of the contents over time. Um, but one thing is when I do a search with Google, I know where this information came from, I can sort of evaluate the source and figure out, do I like it? With something like ChatGPT, which is, by the way, not true to all of these apps, right? Like right. Um, I, I've been using Perplexity, but I think you know what I'm getting at. It doesn't give you citations yes. and it sort of refuses to do that. Uh, perplexity and it hallucinates a few incorrect things yeah, in your well, college essay. So <laughs> yeah, well, I asked it to write me a bio and uh, <laughs> well, I got credit for a lot of great things I didn't do. Exactly. Right. I, I went to an Austin restaurant. I was asking it what to eat there. It gave me six items, four of which were perfectly great uh, and right on top uh, topic. Two had never been on the menu. Right. So the, the, if you're going to cheat and do a college essay, there's two rules. You have to validate every fact or use a system that shows you where the fact came from so you can validate it yourself and make sure, because even those systems are large language model based and they hallucinate large language models, this technology that's underneath perplexity or Google Bard or uh, chat GPT, they all hallucinate. So you have to validate everything they tell you. That's rule number one. If you're gonna turn in a college essay and try and, uh, you know, and try to get credit for that. You know, you have to validate everything. Otherwise the teacher's going to know you cheated. Uh, and two, you have to add some human sauce to it because it gives you a cold answer, right? It, it, it presents a certain pattern, right? Which is usually useful, but you know, a, a teacher can tell oh, that look, that looks like you use chat GPT to answer that and you didn't add anything on top of it. Right. But if you, if you take that as a guideline and write your own essay but with that, with some personal experiences and some personal thinking and some style, you know, the teacher's not going to be able to tell. No, but I do worry about it from the perspective of yes. Um, you know, uh, again, taking the answers. As we know, humans are unfortunately pretty um, lazy, I would say, and yeah. uh, they don't tend to go the extra mile. And so I yeah. worry that because I, I think where it's going heading and correct me if you disagree, but I think it's going to be a Siri um, feature. I think it's going to be a Alexa feature. And I think it's going to be a Google feature and, and other search engines. So ultimately, I think our search engines are going to be powered by AI, uh, chat GBT type um, um, yes. apps. And so, or bar Bard, or bar, Meta is yeah. building a whole bunch of models, right? Exactly. Yeah. So you know, and in many ways, they can do some amazing things that you know, if you know what to ask. But it, the hallucinations and the uh, other aspect is not knowing where that information came from. Those things really worry me a lot. What are your thoughts on that? And is it solvable? I, I think if you're in school, the 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 purpose of being in school is to learn, not to cheat, right? So if you're using ChatGPT just to write your essay and not do any mental work of doing the homework to understand that topic, you're gonna, you're gonna, you're doing it for the wrong purpose. But if you say, hey, show me all points of view on a topic, it's very good at teaching you, right? So yeah. it's a good learning tool. That's the way I treat it. Same thing going to a restaurant. You know, a restaurant, if it gives you some bullshit, it's, it's not very much consequence, right? You know, because if you ask for Brussels sprouts and the a restaurant doesn't have Brussels sprouts, then all of a sudden, you know, it's not a big deal. But if you're turning in an essay or doing something like a doctor or, you know, a, a, a nurse's station or something like that, you have to be much more accurate. And there are ways to build AI systems that are very, very accurate. It's just... Uh, the chat GPT is based on a single LLM and has a few problems still. 
right? Yeah, well, I would say so. I, I tried to che cheat with that um, because I was trying to get citations for my book and I had to turn them into APA style. And I thought, well, I don't want to do it. Let's get the chat GPT to do it. And, and I tried a couple of that, uh, other tools. Um, and it looked pretty good. And then I started verifying it and yeah. realized that it was inventing the names of the authors and sometimes the dates as well. Do you think that yeah. is something that we're going to be able to overcome? Like what, what's, what are you hearing? The, on that the error rates go up when it doesn't under, when it hasn't really studied your topic very well. Right. Because mm -hmm. keep in mind, it's ingested a lot of things like Wikipedia. Right. Yeah to build the model, runs them through a bunch of NVIDIA cards, builds a model out of that. That's the large language model that I keep talking about. If you're in the training set, if your data is in the training set, it's very accurate. But if it's not, it starts hallucinating. It's like a human being. When you ask a human being uh, about something that they really don't understand, they start lying to you. <laughs> right, and it's the well, same. They make thing up entire names, though, and I don't keep those humans of beings around. But here's some techniques you can do to make the error rates go up. First of all, ask it to take a breath before answering. Why does that work? I don't know. But the comp the complexity really? of these, yeah, this is true. <laughs> the, that makes zero. It still will have errors, but it, the error rate goes down, right? The, the number of errors per thousand characters goes down for some reason because it has more time to think and 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 uh, uh, generate a better answer. If you ask it, if you don't know, please tell me you don't know. The error rate goes way down, right? So yeah. you, there's some prompt engineering that you could add on to AI to get the engine to give you a more accurate answer if you can give it a little bit more about what you were already doing, the answers get better, right? So giving it more context or giving it more of your writing before you ask it to start giving you answers, all of a sudden the error rates go down, right? So there's ways to reduce the error rates. Um, if you're a programmer, I, a programmer in, in Austin told me this, he said you can um, have it export an answer import it back into the same LLM, same machine, have it rate the answer, rate its own answer. The rating system is in a different part of the machine than the export, uh, than the answer creation part of the machine. And it does really well at rating its own answers for accuracy, <laughs> which is crazy, wow. right? And so you I can build systems that. now, it, the banks and stuff like that, they don't use one LLM. They have a group of LLMs that are all checking and arguing over their answers. And the error rates when you do such a thing goes way down, right? Because mm -hmm. of this te te technique, right? So it, there's a bit of learning about the system and a little bit of learning how to prompt and learning which system might be better for your use case. If you're building a research report, maybe chat GPT is not the best one because it doesn't give you links to where it learned everything from, right? It makes it harder to validate. Where do you think this is heading? Like, I mean, a lot of people are obviously very concerned that it's going to replace all their jobs. Other people mm. are afraid that it's going to take over the world and then, you know, it's Terminator. Um, other people are very excited and think it's going to lead somewhere good. I'm curious to know where you with fall. The, with the current system, yeah. which these large language models are really next token predictor systems, i.e., they're really good. They're built to predict what is the next word it should lay down. And it's really amazing at doing that, but it doesn't really know anything, right? And its data set is very incomplete. For instance, it found me a screw at a local Lowe's. It has a world model inside the model, right? So it understands, oh, you, you got to go this aisle. It's about halfway down. It answered the question correctly. But when I asked it to find me a coffee at San Jose International Airport, it couldn't find me one because it didn't have oh. that data in it. And if you forced it to, it would hallucinate and give you a wrong answer, right? So it's so. not there. Well, it's here, not there here. yet. I mean, I, the, 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 the AI doomerism is more like um, what, what happens once we get AGI, where the system really knows everything and is behaving much more like a human. It, it, it's starting to, but it's a long way from that, right? I mean, it has happened. Where it could actually tell you what to do 
yeah. without being prompted, right? That that leads into a whole bunch of problems later down the, ro the road. But by that point, the AI is helping us put guardrails around everything, you know, to make it safer. So I, I'm not too worried about the long term. This short term period, the next 18 months, for me, it's about personal AI. Having an AI assistant that you talk to that can help you with your emails, help you with your marketing, help you with tasks. You know, hey, I, I need to do uh, employee reviews today. Can you give me some tips on how to review this person? Here's, you know, right or write the review. Here's five facts. Find about the cheapest. The uh, the yeah, it's really good at that. Or. Yeah. But my psychiatrist uses it to listen to her therapy session. She built a whole system and it's really amazing at that. There, the errors don't show up, right? It really? doesn't have hallucinations because it's listening to you and just writing notes. It's really good at that. It's a large language model. It understands language really, really well. And so if you ask it just to deal with the language part of it, write notes, uh, help me with an email, stuff like that. It's usually pretty good. You don't see a lot of hallucinations. If you're asking it to uh, teach you about, you know, something highly scientific, the, in other words, write me a college level essay on, you know, dentistry. That's when it, you can start seeing these kinds of hallucination problems or confabulation problems is the technical term. Yeah, and I've talked to some teachers. Um, it sounds like they're having to really rethink uh, what they offer uh, these days. So A, tests are kind of in person and and uh, or essays, they have to do it in class, but also they're rethinking the idea of the essay altogether. So I think that's going to shift. Uh, where where I see it, sh here's where I see, I guess, the, the threat a so-called threat of AI. And that is in, so we've had a lot of technological changes over the years, right? And yeah. yes, it displaced some people um, and it will displace people again. But with AI, where I'm seeing this going is like, it's going to displace a lot more people in a lot more fields all at once very quickly. Yeah. I also think it's going to take what it is that is, makes us human um, and it actually will increase the value of that. Yes. But the people who do things that are more mundane, even in, say, journalism and reporting, people tell me all the time that, hey, it's mm. going to replace your job and you're afraid of this. Well, what I would say is that yeah. it will replace certain kinds of tasks, Yes. Um, particularly if someone was writing without uh, doing reporting or a point of view. But the things that makes that are essential as a human being, those things cannot be replaced, but can be enhanced by the machine. But you know, I'd love to hear your thoughts on that. No, certain kinds of jobs are going to get wiped out real fast. Uh, call center jobs, for instance. I, I was using Hippocratic's AI, AI system. It, it hasn't yet been released, but they showed it to me. And it replaces a nurse's system uh, where you call in for an appointment. Right. Like if you're calling your doctor for a colonoscopy appointment, right? That's what I was doing with them. And it knew everything. I was throwing everything I could think of about a colonoscopy appointment, like where to park, uh, when should my wife pick me up? Uh, wow. What are some side effects that I should be w worried about? Uh, do I have to drink that shitty fluid? To, you know, to clean me out. And it's told me it's it, just like a human would. It's like, you have to drink it, but you could th throw some lemon in it to make it taste a little bit better or something like that. Right. But <laughs> really, uh, yeah, yeah. You know, and it was right on point because it was fine tuned on a very specific data set. And there you don't have hallucination issues because you're only there to talk to the nurses station about nurses stuff. You're not there to ask for a Big Mac or a history essay, right? You're there to talk to a hospital about an appointment coming tomorrow, right? It's very accurate at that. And it's going to replace some jobs. Mm -hmm. uh, call center kind of things, you know, technical support. It's really good at technical support. So if you fine tune it on technical support for the machines your company makes, it can answer those and it sounds like a human. And why do you need a human if it can answer all the questions? We well, can even take a human who has a very thick, uh, perhaps Indian accent, which seems to be the case a lot. And it can make them sound like they are 
native speaker, which is sort of yeah. But I'm saying there's not going to be a human at all. (laughs) The nurse was talking to it on the phone, and it was not a human at all. No human involved. So it's going to take over that kind of job pretty quick. Right. But economically, that's got to be, you know, pretty devastating to all these call center guys and girls and just in general. Right. It, it's like a huge all at problem. Once. It's a huge problem. And let's take uh, the number one job in America is truck driving or, t- or taxis. Right. Driving, uh, driving people. More than a million people have that kind of job. I can tell you definitively my car out in the garage drives me around town. So tell me again, how many years is it before a truck comes along that drives everywhere and is so good and better than a human? It's not very far away. It's sometime in the next decade. We have to change some of our infrastructure. At least that's what I've been told, is that uh, mm-hmm. if everything is self-driving, you're going to need you know, different roads. And so there's no. going to be adjustment. You don't think so? No, no that's absolutely false. The, the okay. Tesla proves that's false. The, well, my there Tesla aren't drives many on existing roads. What's that? Well, there aren't like it's not like every car is a Tesla. It, uh, I mean, no, when no, they but when that, autonomous cars like, come, they're going to kill the job of driving because driving costs okay. money. And so we have to figure out as a society, what do you do with the truck driver that gets replaced by a computer? Right. Do you think it's not we're not going to own cars anymore because uh, we're just going to basically Long have term, yeah, no, but yeah. I, I'm just talking about t- taxi drivers and people who drive truck drivers. We have 1.3 million truck drivers in the United States. They are going to be replaced in the next 20 years by computers. So we have to have a discussion as a society. What do we do with those people? How do we retrain them? Do we have a guaranteed minimum income for them so that they can afford to f- feed their families? Families while they get retrained for a new job, right? Is there a new job for them? And I think that's such an important conversation because I used to be, I remember when Andrew Yang ran and he, you know, talked about a universal basic income. And at the time I was not a big proponent of that because I thought, well, that's going to drive inflation up. But but when AI started becoming a greater thing, I I had changed my mind about that because I don't know what we're going to do with the people who are displaced by AI. And not everyone's going to have the kind of, look, I think there's going to be some service, you know, people like need um, human contact. So some of these people are going to go there and then we're going to have sort of the, you know, the laptop class kind of jobs, some of which will be replaced as well, but some of them will stick around. But what happens to the people? Because not everyone there's a lot of new jobs coming and that's hard to explain but okay, that, so these that's new good. jobs require new skills <laughs> right if you're a truck driver you don't have the jobs to build ais right uh you don't even have the skills to be a plumber or an electrician or you know somebody working in another job that we need there's going to be there's still there's plenty of jobs we need that humans are going to be able to do better than robots but they require some training so i instead of guaranteed minimum income i hate that idea because mm. humans don't do well with that uh we we treat the native americans in america that way we give them a, a, a guaranteed minimum income their lives are not very good they have a high rate of alcoholism a high rate of hopelessness right and it's not a society that i want my kids to be a part of but there is a better short term answer which is a new gi bill my dad escaped poverty in new york he he grew up in the projects in brooklyn um by getting an education he got that education paid for by the army. He went to the army, had a GI Bill, which paid for, gave him enough wealth to get retrained on a new job. And it turned into a pretty lucrative job for him. We need the same thing here. We need a way to guarantee a truck driver that they're going to have two to four years to study something new without worrying about paying for their family. Because you can't learn something new if you're having to drive an Uber car every night just to try to pay your bill, you know, your bills and put food on your family's table. So we need a new kind of policy in America. But this is a problem because politicians in America don't get along. <laughs> We're a very divided country. And getting them to understand that there is a need here uh, and get them to fund it is really a hard problem. But that's the answer. A guaranteed, a new American dream bill, I would call it, i.e. a new shot at the American dream for people who get laid off. 
you get two to four years, your education is completely paid for, your housing is completely paid for, your family is secure for that time. So you can spend some time learning something new. I've seen truck drivers go from truck drivers to running VR companies, but it took a, an unusual schooling system and an unusual uh, um, salary system to give that person the freedom to go back to school and learn something new. That's a fair <laughs> shot at the American dream. So I, I like that idea, but I would also, I guess the counter argument would be that maybe not all truck drivers are going to be able to relearn something, you know, particularly if this is something that's much more highly skilled. If you give um, them four years and they can't mentally handle it, then yeah, we need a safety net for those people. Yeah. Like we need a safety net for a whole bunch of people who are unemployable today. But you know, my son is never going to have a job. Mm -hmm. He's a special needs kid, right? Mm -hmm. There's a safety net for him because you don't want that person out in the street ripping you off, right? <laughs> no, <laughs> right? I wouldn't want that, no. <laughs> no, you don't want that. So in, as a society, we get together and go, oh, okay, some people deserve a safety net and, you know, and we have to fund that. But there's most pe most truck drivers are very smart people and have skills with people, have skills with their bodies to do things. They can do a whole range of jobs. And I've seen them go from truck driving to tech company executives. So I know it's possible. Sure. For, so for what, what are some jobs that you see coming uh, down the pipeline Ooh. that are new? Oh, man. <laughs> um, it's hard to explain because we're we're about to get augmented reality glasses. Um, and mm. in those glasses, you're going to have new kinds of entertainment, new kinds of sporting, new kinds of games, new kinds of education. Right. Somebody all has to build all that. Even if the AI is assisting you, you still need a human being behind it to be part of the creativity that yeah. it takes to get the AI to spit out, you know, 3D assets for a video game. Are right? you talking about like the Apple ones or just in general? There's more in general. I mean, I've seen yeah. I've seen what I do, I, I fly around R and D labs around the world and see what's coming. And it, a lot of them come to my house and show, show love me. Your job. <laughs> yeah, it's a lot of fun. And so I, I'd see what's coming is a new kind of uh, metaverse digital twin. Right. I mean, yeah. look at VW. They, they scan their entire factory floor. There's a guy who, or a team there that did that. That's a new job that didn't exist three years ago. Right. So there's a lot of new jobs, but they tend to be a little bit more technical in, mm -hmm. in bent, you know, which is hard to sell to Americans who are driving trucks or working at a retail store. Right. Well, I also think artisanal things, um, just like we're, we're seeing yeah. like, you know, the hipster movement, I'll call it, you know, uh, I think there is like that desire to have these artisanal things. So I see uh, some people who are good with their hands and crafty sort of going in that direction, but with augmented reality, cause I, I remember when I started first getting invited and seeing some of these, um, augmented reality tools. I was very, very, very excited about it because I thought that had even more potential than just like virtual reality. Um, I, I have so many ideas for augmented reality and um, implementing it. And then you don't see it really like being implemented because it, it has existed for a long time now. Even VR, like th there'd be like these headlines for years and years, like VR is the next thing, VR is the next thing in the 90s and it's later. Yeah. And then it doesn't take, and then it kind of did take, but it took more in the gaming world for the most part and, and also the world that's rated X. So yeah. why? Not be Partly crazy. because the screens <laughs> just aren't good enough to work on. Uh, they're getting close. The Apple device has two 5K screens in front of mm -hmm. you. That is good enough to work on, but it's a $3,500 device. Varjo, a company, a small little company out of Scandinavia, had that a few years ago, but their device was $13,000 for the device and a, a computer that could drive it, right? That's too expensive for consumers. Um, it's good I for Volvo. And, and price seem to be. 
And then it, also like the content, right? Because for, for example, one way that I thought it would be useful. But if the content is driven by the screens. The reason Zuckerberg yeah. had to go with games because he couldn't do anything else, really. He, I mean, I, I, I used an app called Nanome in the Quest 2, for instance. Nanome lets you do material science and lets you see chemi chemical structures as big as your house. Right. So yeah. you can blow up a, a molecule as big as your house and walk around it with a bunch of scientists. Really amazing. But you needed a really expensive computer to drive that. If you only tried to drive it with the computer in the headset, you would only get a piece of it. You wouldn't see the whole thing, you know, and and the screens just aren't sharp enough to read text yet. I mean, a lot of text. Right. Which is if you're going to do a scientific kind of thing or write an email or answer a Facebook post, you got to be able to read text and the screens just aren't quite there yet. And then mm -hmm. we have to worry about, you know, can you wear this for eight hours? It's not there yet. Right? No. And when I wear the Oc look, Oculus Rift, huge for progress, um, it, it, it could do beautiful things. But the form factor does play such a role because yeah. I don't want to put it on. I feel yeah. claustrophobic inside of it, right? Yeah. <laughs> I got a bunch I, of these oh, headsets bunch. behind me, you know, big ass <laughs> headsets, right? I mean, look, they're they're like I said, very impressive. Um, and and they have this movie theater mode, for example, you can watch Netflix, right? But who wants to be inside that device for that the, many hours? And the and, problem and is the Netflix example is a great one. With the Quest Two, you have two two K screens in front of you. OK, and the mm -hmm. screens aren't very good. They don't have a good black. They don't have good color dy dynamics. They're cheap ass screens because that's what Mark Zuckerberg could afford to put in a five hundred dollar device. Yeah. He couldn't afford a thirteen thousand dollar device because he knew a consumer would never be able to buy that. Yeah. So he went to cheap screens in the in the glasses well my tv on the wall is way fucking better than a quest i'm sorry way better than a quest 2 or a quest 3 headset to watch a movie so you know now the apple device is coming next year that's good enough to watch a really good movie and be comparable to my eight thousand dollar tv on the wall right mm -hmm. or an well, iMac. it's not another google glasses right like eh, it will be for a while until yeah. it until we get a pair of glasses and we're still a uh, it needs to look right to it needs away. to because the cool factor is a big factor and then and then i think the you know like i said i don't want to feel claustrophobic trapped in my device then i don't want to put it on like i enjoy it when it's on you can do wonderful things you can draw you can have yeah. games you can have experiences that's all wonderful but if I don't want to put that device on because of the form factor, I'm not going to. Yeah. Um, but people wear headphones. I, I just flew from Spain last know. night. Everybody <laughs> had headphones on, right? Yeah. Well, they're easier. Um, yeah. and, and again, like people love the uh, the ones that just go in your ear, right? The yeah. little ones. Um, usually when I record these, I, I wear one of those I, in one ear and I look like a special agent. Um, and then it yeah. doesn't block my other ear. So it's like, I really like it. I, I got the mine form touch. factor is a big, yeah. I mean, the form factor is like a very, very big component. And I think part of why some of these tools didn't take off is because of that form factor, not necessarily because the technology itself yeah. was impractical or, or not um, interesting or not well done. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. Oh, see, now you're going to look like a Star Trek. Yeah, this is the HoloLens for Microsoft, right? And yeah. this gives you an idea that this is very heavy, very big, only could be powered for a couple hours, right? And had mm -hmm. shitty screens. The screens are really impressive at one side because mm -hmm. uh, it, like there's a game in here called Fragments where aliens blow holes in the real walls around yeah. you, right? It's stunningly cool, but it's very dim and it's a small box that the virtual stuff is in, right? Exactly. It, it's just not there for, this is not a consumer device. No consumer is going to buy this. Plus this yeah, was $3,500. Yeah, and this is actually smaller uh, in form factor than the um, the, the Facebook, the Oculus one. Yeah. Um, I mean, Oculus has um, a really great price, um, and, and it's quite a great device for the price. Yeah. But it yeah. is not something like, for example, I love 
I love these idea tools for like exercise, right? Like you can yeah. combine, and I've, I've tested some devices where you can actually combine exercise with physical movement, uh, like physical movement in a virtual world, right? So, um, and they were very badly done because there were sort of more models, but for example, you can go into a game, you can run around, but you're physically moving, but you're yeah. moving yeah. in one place. But the problem is you're not going to install that kind of device in, in an average living room. It's 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 sort of flawed. And so form factor, I think, is a very key determining factor in how technology proliferates. Absolutely. Think- this is why Apple, you know, Apple always comes in late. The Apple II was not the first personal computer. People forget that. There was other personal computers before Apple II. It was not the first GUI with the Macintosh. Xerox had a GUI long before the Macintosh came out, right? But it comes in late and it redefines the space because it certainly with this kind of product, Apple's done more human factor testing or R&D than they've done with any product combined before, including the iPhone. And they know the problems. They know these problems, right? They know that the consumers are not uh, willing to do this. And what did they do? They spent a lot of time on recreating the room around you virtually in the headset so that you would feel like you're part of the world around you, yeah. that you could see your kids walking through the, the room, stuff like that. You know, Zuckerberg didn't do that when he first brought out VR. And because Zuckerberg was first, he was a pioneer. And he deserves a lot of credit for that. But he, he shipped with a lot of problems. And Apple's going to take care of that problem. Start with audio. He put a shitty pair of, of headphones in the Quest 2. So if you wanted to go to a concert or watch a movie, the experience sucked. Well, who's the number one headphone manufacturer in the world? Apple. These do not suck, these little $250 headphones. They do spatial audio. They have way better bass than the headphones that Zuckerberg shipped on the Quest, right? They have way better definition. So when he hooks those up with the headset that's coming, and that's what's coming, these these and the headset mm-hmm. work together, now we can watch a movie or go Even to a better. concert. I don't know if you've come across this product. You may have. Um, I saw it at SEC. Um, couple of years ago, I think now. Um, It was quite neat. So it was, um, it it comes from an Israeli company. Unfortunately, I don't recall the name, but uh, what you can do is you can, you hear the audio, but only if you're in a particular angle and proximity. So the people around you do not hear it. And I think for them, it was like a light, because it's quite expensive for the average consumer, but I think it was more of a licensing play. And I think something like that would, could do really well because then you don't even have to wear headphones. And you're you're like completely untethered and you're completely free and you can talk to your devices. You, you know, there's a lot you can do with it. Yeah. It'll be interesting to see what what wins. Uh, you know, a, a pair of glasses is coming. And a pair of glasses with these makes a lot of sense to me. Mm-hmm. The other devices, until you give me good audio so I can go to a concert, <laughs> You know, and it, how are you going to beat Apple at audio? They're the number one headphone manufacturer in the world. They put more technology in these little headphones, right, than mm-hmm. was in an iPhone 4, is inside one of these little tiny headphones. So until you can tell me how you're going to do that as a company at scale and, and get consumers to trust it and love it and see it, Apple has retail stores. These other companies don't. So how are you going to sell it to the world? Apple can, right? Only that's Apple. Can. This is well, the problem. I think Apple can license it, but but I but yeah. I don't think it's going to be at the same quality. Well, I'm wondering. Okay, so because you see a lot of different devices, different technologies, and a lot of the AI stuff that's coming out. What are the things that you can share that are like you are most sort of excited, geeked out about? Yeah. I'm watching the personal AI space very closely. Soon we're going to have an AI that we can talk to and mm-hmm. can tell us how to improve our lives as we're talking. Um, Avi Schiffman has been showing off a pendant that does this, right? It just listens to him pitching people at VC meetings and tells them, well, you were rude to that person. Maybe you should be this nicer next time and you'll have a better outcome, right? Almost in real time. and. That that kind of personal AI is coming. It's um, 
it, it, to do that, you, you have to have an AI that really understands the world much better than the current chat GPT. So we're like, how do we get there? Could Google get there? Google has the data. <laughs> they have all the data. <laughs> they have the biggest AI team. So we're all watching for Google. What is Google going to do when they enter large language models in mass with their real big guns, not, not small playing around? They have a thing called Gemini coming that everybody is watching. So next year is going to be very interesting. What is Google's Gemini? How does it compete? How does it enable a new kind of personal AI? Because they know, like when you start uh, walking through New York and start thinking about what you would talk to an AI about, well, something I would talk to it about is how do I get across town? Hmm. Google's maps tells you and shows you how in live detail when the next subway is coming and how to get into the right tunnel to the right subway train. Uh, chat gpt can't do that yet right so rock and the fact that it uses uh social media data in particular like is mm. this almost like because some ways i would feel like it's almost dangerous because social media has a lot of false information on it um, um so how does it sort of decide? But it can tell you where to stand to take a good picture of the Golden Gate Bridge because Mark Zuckerberg has that data. How many pictures of the Golden Gate Bridge does Instagram have? Millions. Each one of those photos has comments and likes on it. So it can know where people stand to take the most popular pictures of the Golden Gate Bridge and can tell you, hey, move 10 feet to the left, you're going to get more likes. That's yeah, the kind that's of thing that I should issue. be telling me about, right? It's like helping yeah. me deal with the life, the world and be more productive in the world. Somebody told me that they used, uh, they told AI what, um, what, what groceries they have, what, what they have in the fridge and asked yeah. it to provide some recipes. Yes. Not something Google would do, but yeah. Well, Google has Google Lens, which you could do piece of that, but it's not hooked up to the large language model yet. So you can't talk yeah. to it. That's where ChatGPT is so brilliant. They have the computer vision now. I already did this with my uh, spice rack, took a picture of my spice rack, asked it to make an inventory. It did. Was it completely accurate? It was mostly accurate. And you could add a little human thing onto it to make it 100% accurate. And then you can talk to it. What can I make with this? And it does, it answers it. And then you can add on a few extra things, like I need it for 12 people, or I need it for four people, right? And it can rejigger the, every recipe it's showing you. It's really powerful at that. I think once it marries Siri or Alexa, I think it will become much more. Well, Siri and Alexa today do not have large language models. They don't, wow. for instance, if you ask Siri, can you take me back to um, my car? It doesn't do it. It doesn't understand you. If you say, can you take me back to my park car? It does because you hit the trigger, right? It's hard coded. It's inflexible. It's not, uh, it doesn't but understand. Once it has AI in it, I Bingo. do think it's a game changer. Like I was Bingo. thinking that from the very beginning. <laughs> and we're all waiting for Apple. What's Apple's LLM strategy, right? Yeah. How are they going to change Siri to be really smart and understand us and do all this fun new stuff? that chat GPT open AI is doing, right? We're waiting. I don't know when. What, it, okay. So I'd say two, three years. I Certainly by the time the glasses come out and th this, the schedule is there's gonna be the Vision Pro next year. The year after that is gonna be a smaller, lighter, much more capable Vision Pro. Maybe even a family of them, like, you know, an expensive model and a cheaper model. And then the glasses come a year after that. So three years. Um, when the glasses come, it has to have an LLM because mm -hmm. that's the whole point of re why you would wear a pair of glasses is to be able to talk to them and have it assist you at any task you can think of, right? So final question is like, what are you most excited about when it comes to AI? And what are you most fearful or concerned about? Um, short term, I'm fearful for jobs, uh, you know, particularly like, you know, like what we talked about, truck driving and, and, um, and all that. Uh, 
excited i i mean the the having a personal assistant that assists me every day is is going to be very interested interesting to consumers consumers are going to decide on what ecosystem they join based on who has the best one right and if google has a better one than apple then all of a sudden people are going to start switching over to the google ecosystem because they have better answers and you can if you're wearing a Google pair of glasses or holding an Android phone, uh, it's going to help you live your life much better than the Apple one. And that will be a, a big deal, right? Um, yeah, that's where I'm going. I, for my own show, I'm covering how businesses are using this stuff, yep. you know, uh, from hospitals to call centers to marketing teams, right? How are they building systems that... Um, uh, can use AI to help their businesses. And there's a whole, there's 500 companies that found just doing that. So that's a mm -hmm. lot to focus on and, and think about, but that's not very sexy, you know, helping a call center replace humans, you know, and help their customer ranking because their answers are more accurate than the, than a human can give. Right. Well, what can a human understand better about AI? Like if they, you know, if you're like, educate yourself, as they say, um, what would be the one thing that you think most consumers are missing? I think that most consumers have no idea. There's 4,000 companies that are going after all sorts of different things from from this personal AI to working at, at your company, right? So if if I was starting out, I'd be starting out looking at those companies very closely and understanding what the impact of them is on your life or your business's life, right? Uh, most people haven't even tried ChatGPT and really understood how to use it. And we talked about a few things you can try there. Understand prompt and you know how to write a more complex prompt than just you know uttering something to Google, right? Um, understand what it does and start getting educated on that. Because if you're educated on that, you're going to build systems using AI. Therefore, you're going to have a job where your coworkers who refuse to do that are going to get cut, right? Mm -hmm. I've had CEO after CEO tell me, no, I'm never going to fire somebody who uses AI in the job because they're going to be more productive. It's a competition now. It's a lazy who person's way, which I think is good. Yep. And I got to run. I'm sorry. Yeah, no, no, no worries. Well, thank you so much for joining me. And how can people find you? Uh, Scovalizer on x.com is generally the best where I spend most of my time because I'm watching 70,000 people in the AI space and I'm resharing the best of what's going on with these people. And these are all people like PhD level people who are cr creating these AIs or building AIs into their businesses. And so it's a good way to watch this world and get up to date pretty quick. Perfect. Well, thank you so much for joining me. And uh, despite the technical difficulties, and thanks again. And thanks. hopefully we'll talk again someday. Absolutely. Okay. Talk to you later. Bye.